When I am right, they praise me. When I am wrong, they don't. They attack me. And without them, I would not be able to function as the Prime Minister of Australia. And then he made a historic pronouncement that if the number of lawyers present in the parliament goes below a particular point, which I have in mind, I shall retire from politics and no longer claim to be a successful Prime Minister. Sir Robert Menezes was for 15 years the Attorney General of Australia before he became the Prime Minister of that country. That itself was a tribute to a great lawyer becoming a great Prime Minister of one of the greatest uh, parts of the Commonwealth of it. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was 1965. We are now in the year 2012. The first decade of the 21st century is gone. Something is wrong with the 21st century because nothing seems to be going right. We will we'll go into many other aspects of the 21st century, what is happening today. But ladies and gentlemen, you might be shocked at what I am telling you. That the pharmaceutical laboratories in the United States have now decided that in their laboratories, their scientific experiments are carried on. They have decided to use lawyers instead of rats. I heard this, I said, my God, lawyers have some role to play in the advancement of science. <laughs> but then the laboratories pronounced their three reasons why they had taken this decision. The first reason they gave was that lawyers are more numerous than rats. The criminal justice system. The criminal justice system must have lawyers of the evidence and the character of Daniel. They don't have it. They are not educated enough to know that there are two rules framed by the Bar Council of India, the rules of professional conduct and etiquette, which is, which is the most important part of the ethics of a lawyer. And I am proud of the fact that these rules of professional conduct and etiquette were promulgated when I was the chairman of the Bar Council of India. Duty than those whom you believe to be innocent. A client comes to you for your assistance, he doesn't come to you for your opinion. We have adopted the adversarial system of criminal justice. The adversarial system of criminal justice has one philosophy behind it, that two persons ranged on both sides try to defeat justice as much as they want to, but ultimately the best way of justice triumphing is the judgment of the court which hears extreme arguments on both sides. That's the essence of the adversarial system. But ladies and gentlemen, to this philosophy of the adversarial system, there is another exception which you must notice, and that applies to those lawyers who appear on behalf of the prosecution in criminal cases. I have great to say that the highest law officers today of the country, the highest public prosecutors and the best public prosecutors in the country are not aware of this rule of professional conduct particularly applicable to lawyers appearing for the prosecution in criminal cases. That is Rule 16. Please read it again and again. And you, Mr. Sahab, you are in the Bar Council. Please make this a condition that the prosecutors to be appointed must be properly educated in Rule 16 of the Bar Council of India Rules. It says that no person in charge of a prosecution shall so conduct the prosecution that it leads to the conviction of the innocent. And ladies and gentlemen, one another part of this same article is that the secreting or the withholding of material which might be of help to an accused person in establishing his innocence is hereby prohibited. Ladies and gentlemen, in India, the right of a fair trial is deduced from Article 21 of the Constitution. The right of an accused to a fair trial 
is a constitutional right. It is not a right conferred by the criminal procedure code. England has no constitution. They have some kind of a constitution now. But England became a party to the Treaty of Rome, which created the European Union. The European Union's <coughs> convention, which created the European Union, has that every citizen of every part of the Union shall be entitled to a fair trial. And ladies and gentlemen, from the provision of this convention to which England is a party, the right of a fair trial, they have deduced the right of disclosure. The Attorney General of India, of, of, of England, has now appointed disclosure officers whose duty is to, to study the brief in every criminal case and find out what will help the accused to establish his innocence. It is the duty of that discovery officer to communicate to the lawyers of the defense that we have got this material in our files and if you want to avail of it, here it is, we are going to disclose it to you. The Attorney General's rules of disclosure are to be found in any book on criminal law today from here, from England, particularly Blackstone's book and Archibald's on criminal practice with the classical textbooks. Read those books. What are the cases in which an accused is constitutionally entitled to a disclosure of the material in his favor? <coughs> Any witness whom the police interrogated and who said that the accused is not the guilty one, you must disclose those names. How did a poor accused know that when they went to investigate on the scene of offense, ten witnesses told them that Mr. A is guilty and not B? He would not know. He has no access to the files of the prosecution, to the case diaries that you call them in the criminal procedure code section 172. But if there are witnesses who have told the police in the first instance that this man is not the man, it was somebody else, it is his due, your duty first to disclose it to the attorneys and the solicitors of the accused person in the trial. But I have just given you, ladies and gentlemen, an example which arises from Maharashtra. There used to be a leader, a Congress leader from Sindh, his name was Bhai Pratap. He was the founder, he wanted to create a new state of Sindh, you know, for Sindhi, uh, in somewhere in the northern Gujarat, in the, in the region of Kutch. He was a great man, but he was also a business one. And he was prosecuted for having sold away imported goods which were imported on the condition that they will be used for a particular purpose. But he did not use them for that particular purpose because of serious offense in those days. And ladies and gentlemen, he was prosecuted. Prosecuted and convicted by the Sessions Court of Bombay and sentenced to 18 months rigorous imprisonment. He appealed to the High Court and the Crown, the State appealed against the sentence. His appeal was dismissed and the sentence was raised from 18 months to 5 years. His appeal was dismissed by the Supreme Court. He applied for mercy to the government. Vijay Lakshmi Pratis at that time was, a, I think, the governor of Maharashtra at that time. But ladies and gentlemen, this Bhai Pratap happened to be a person of some influence in Maharashtan society. His daughter was married to one of the Achut Patwarman boys, Manu Patwar. You, you must have heard that family. And when that application for mercy and pardon went to the High Court, to the, to the government, there were two Parsi secretaries in the ministry, Bay Master and, and Dalal, they examined the file. In the case of a poorer man, nobody would examine the file, but they did it in this case. 
and believe me that they came to the conclusion that my God, the whole evidence would show that he is totally innocent has been suppressed. But they were Parsis and they were dealing with ultimately a Sindhi. They called me. They said, we are convinced that he is innocent. We want to pardon him, but we want some favor from you. I said, what favor do you want from me? They said, you know that Commander Nanavati has been convicted for having killed Prem Auja. And we want to pardon him. You gave us the consent of the Sindhi community that they will have no objection to him being pardoned. So I called the sister of Prem Auja and said, now listen, whatever might have happened, there is no doubt that Prem was carrying on with his life. So the poor fellow may not have a grave and sudden provocation, but he knew it for a long time. So therefore he is rightly convicted. But there is something to be said in his favor. And now that he has suffered for five, six years, if you say that the Sindhis will have no objection, so I got a consent letter from her and that letter. And Bhai Pratap and Commander Nanavati were pardoned on the same day by the same governor. But there he was pardoned because of the sympathy of particularly of the young ladies in India. Uh, there used to be every day demonstrations at Trora Fountain and women used to write down those uh, couplets in their favor with their lipsticks. All that happened in those days. So ladies and gentlemen, this tells you the value of the duty of disclosure in a criminal case, which is a duty now made a statutory duty under the Bar Council rules, but few prosecutors are prepared to perform the logical process. Now ladies and gentlemen, go a little further. As I said, the 22nd article of the Constitution starts with reference to a lawyer. Right from the moment of his arrest, an accused is entitled to consult a lawyer. <coughs> How many lawyers are available for this purpose? Senior lawyers don't do it. They are too busy making money, particularly on the miscellaneous day. You should see in the Supreme Court what happens. And ladies and gentlemen, I must digress for a moment. You said all the good things about me, but you didn't say the only thing which I, which I am more proud of than all the things that you said. I am proud of the fact that I have finished 70 years of legal practice, but I have finished 71 years of teaching law. I was enrolled, I, I became a qualified lawyer at the age of 17. The rule of the Bar Council was that you can't become a lawyer till you are 21. I had to fight my own battle with the powers that be because this rule of 21 years had been introduced while I was a college student. I argued with the Chief Justice of St. Sir Godfrey Davis that you can't apply these retrospectively to me. My father would not have spent money on my education and because he thought that after two years, I am going to support him. How do you propose to do it? So he understood the wisdom and the efficacy of this argument and he told the Bar Council that don't make a general change, but do make a change that in suitable cases you will create an exception. So they created the exception, I applied under that exception and ladies and gentlemen, I had the first class first in the Bombay University in my LLB examination and the Bar Council had no difficulty. Bar Council had no difficulty in enrolling me. They said at least wait for one year, at least become a major. <laughs> because your contracts are void. True. So during that one year when I was not a lawyer, ladies and gentlemen, I taught law and I continued to be a teacher of law and People ask me that at this age you do so much of work, do, do
do all kinds of things. I don't ask you what kind of thing I'll do. <laughs> but, ladies and gentlemen, my, my Prime Minister said he used to ask me this question. Sir. I'm telling you, he's younger than me, by the way, four, four, four years younger than me. He used to ask me. So many times I told him that, uh, uh, we don't bother about this, we'll discuss it someday. So one day, I decided to answer this question. So I told him, I said, Atanji, you are a great scholar of uh, Hindi, you are a great orator, the public speaker, you attract crowds, and, uh, but you don't know anything about world history. So he said, but don't tell me what is about world history. I said, have you heard of King Solomon? He said, yes, I have heard of King Solomon. I said, King Solomon has left a prescription for eternal youth. He looked at me. So I looked at him and said, I tell you, you have a dirty mind. <laughs> I know what you are thinking. He has not left uh, a drug like a Vagra, the young men use these days. So, uh, <laughs> I said, he has not left any medicine or a prescription. He said, but then what have you left? I said, he has left a lesson. What lesson? I said, the lesson that King Solomon has left is that the older you get, the younger should be your company. So again he looked at me and I told him, I said, you have a dirty mind. <laughs> I know what you are thinking. <laughs> I said, but I follow the teaching of King Solomon rigorously, religiously. That is why I go to the colleges and teach. It is the company of the young which, believe you me, keeps me young. And today you have not obliged me by calling me here. You have, in a, in a sense, you have greatly obliged me, but I am quite sure that when I go back, I will feel five years younger. It's a pleasure seeing you all. Now, now Dr. Yashid, you told us that the criminal justice system has failed in the United States. It has but it has failed for totally different reasons. It has failed in India today, first of all because the government has no intention of doing what is the right thing to do, but for the judicial system as a whole, not merely the criminal justice system. Law commission after law commission has said that India needs five times the number of judges that we have today. The government persists in treating the judicial department as a revenue earning department. It should be an spending department of the government. They are not prepared to do that because justice to them doesn't matter. Five times the number of judges are required. The second, the second fault of the system is that judges are not appointed on merit. I don't, I don't wish to mince words as I never do, ladies and gentlemen. Today I appear before two judges of the Supreme Court in a criminal matter dealing with a sentence of death. I know that both the judges in their life have not tried a 323 case. Nobody has examined their juristic credentials at all. Side. Today there is a collegium. Each member of the collegium has a favorite to promote. And they make compromises of all kinds. And ladies and gentlemen, the method of appointment of judges is a big dis disgrace in the country. And unless the educated people of this country raise their voice against the method, <coughs> judiciary will never improve. Judges must first understand how to wield the rules of procedure. The judges don't treat the rules of procedure as rules which promote justice, but they use all the rules for the purpose of frustrating justice. It requires a great acumen to be able to so interpret the rules of procedure that you expedite justice, but you do not expedite it to such an extent that justice marriage becomes justice marriage which is the counterpart of the other maxim of justice, delayed is justice denied. And ladies and gentlemen, 
judges of the highest caliber must be appointed and the salaries of judges should always make them above temptation. <coughs> judges must have salaries which certainly are at least three times the salary of a minister. Then the bar is open to you. If you want to have unlimited amount of money making, come to the bar. But ladies and gentlemen, again the lawyer in this country is spoiled by the pursuit of money. The great lesson, the great lesson of Daniel has forgotten. Law has not continued to remain a profession but it has become a business. And money making has become the dominant object. And ladies and gentlemen, I do make money at the bar. I have started life in a refugee camp in India with a 10 rupee note in my pocket. I have made tons of money, but I have made tons of money from 10% of my clients. My 90% of my practice is today free. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is what the profession requires that you must have lawyers who are committed to serving humanity ultimately. And ladies and gentlemen, when you talk of human rights, as I said, the 22nd article is the greatest tribute to the profession of law. From the moment of arrest, through the investigation, through other <laughs> areas in which a person's liberty is at stake, a lawyer is a prime necessity. It is all right that the article 22nd says that the moment of arrest you have the right to consult a lawyer. You have the right to consult a lawyer all along. But ladies and gentlemen, what about the investigation process in which the main breach of the constitutional right of the accused is the right to silence? <coughs> Article 20 of the Constitution of India says that no person shall be compelled to become a witness against himself. How many bail applications must you have argued? What does the prosecutor come and say? Sir, he is not cooperating with the police. What is the meaning of cooperating that he should plead guilty? You bring him to be guilty and if the legal system was that he is presumed to be guilty, then you have the right to treat him as a convict. As it is, being locked up in the cell of a police station is the greatest punishment. If you are locked up in a jail, the best of jails, ladies and gentlemen, if you are used to a slight aesthetic existence that you require at least a clean toilet, you will you will plead guilty to anything just to get out of that condition of living. That is what Krishna, Krishna Ayar J in his famous Babu judgment in, on bail said that our jail system is itself a great punishment and a person is entitled to be released on bail. If bail is a constitutional right of the accused under Article 21 unless he has forfeited that right by tampering with evidence, supporting evidence, are absconding from justice. Bail is the rule, denial the exception, says Krishna Ayer. And the judges of the Supreme Court had forgotten this law of 77 and ultimately I had to resurrect that law again in Chandra's case now that the whole law has been reaffirmed today and the bail law has been reduced to its pristine glory. That is the greatest right of an accused the constitutional right of the accused to be at liberty to defend himself, to look after his family, to look after his business. Because if you deny him all this, you are already convicting him and punishing him as if he is a convict. You have to deny that unless that denial will, straight, will frustrate justice itself. That's the principle of law. And ladies and gentlemen, as I said, after 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, hardly any lawyer will be prepared to go and sit at the police station 
to defend his land. By judicial decision, it is not in the articles of the Constitution. By judicial decision of the Supreme Court, a decision to which I am a party, Nandini Satpati's case, we got the Supreme Court to hold that while you are being interrogated in police custody, the lawyer has the right to be present. He has the right to be present within sight, but not within hearing. He should know that he is not being abused. He should know that he is not being threatened, that he is state in a state of happiness and normal conditions of existence, and it is in that footing that he is being interrogated. Now this right has been created by constitutional interpretation of Article 21. It is neither provided in the Criminal Procedure Code nor expressly in the Constitution of India. Then comes another kind of a stage. You know of the famous, notorious preventive detention laws. They are a disgrace to democracy in which all the subjective satisfaction, <laughs> doubt of a bureaucrat sitting in the in the, in the Secretariat, a person's liberty can be taken away. And ladies and gentlemen, I must recount to you that when the emergency of India took place, the emergency itself was bogus. I was the chairman of the Bar Council of India at that time. Bar Council of India at that time. And there was a convocation, an annual gathering of the Bar of Kerala somewhere down south in the city of Palgar. And as a chairman of the Bar Council of India, I went there. Ladies and gentlemen, district judges, collectors, police officers of all kinds, and some very, uh, some very prestigious lawyers <coughs> were sitting with me on the stage like this. When I spoke attacking the emergency, and I said that this emergency is a big fraud on Indian democracy, and then slowly the lawyer sitting with me on the stage started leaving them by one. <laughs> they are now the leading lawyers of the Supreme Court. I don't wish to name them. But ladies and gentlemen, on that day they made a report. I left Bangladesh. I went to Bombay. From Bombay I went to Madras. I had to argue some appeal in the Madras High Court on that day. And the Commissioner of Police in Bombay telephoned to my wife. He said, um, there's a warrant out for your arrest of your husband and uh, we want to arrest him. So he told us, my wife told us, he's gone to Madras. He telephoned to me and I said, tell the commissioner that as soon as I finish my appeal, I won't run away, I'm coming back to Bombay. You can arrest me by all means. But I have not been a criminal lawyer in vain. The commissioner of police was a friend. <laughs> He told that counterpart from Bulgar, from Kerala, that listen, who the hell are you, I don't know. You bring the warrant here and then I will execute it on your telephone message, I am going to do nothing of the kind. So that's how we had delayed it. And ladies and gentlemen, by the time I finished my appeal in Madras and got back to Bombay, 300 lawyers, brave lawyers of Bombay had appeared in the High Court of Bombay led by Mr. Palkiwala and Soli Sarabji and they had obtained an injunction restraining them from executing that warrant. <laughs> but I knew, ladies and gentlemen, that this warrant will not last for long. I must make the best of it. And I went round the whole country attacking the emergency and the fraudulent nature of the emergency. Fortunately, they did not have the courage to arrest me, but they could have, in spite of the stay of the High Court. Ladies and gentlemen, be it said to the credit of the judges of this country that nine High Courts delivered judgments in which they said that the judges are not powerless today, even in an emergency, to defend human liberty and we shall continue to defend human liberty. And ladies and gentlemen, the view of the land high courts was a thorn in the flesh of the rulers. They appealed to the Supreme Court. And I regret to say that the appeal came to be heard by five judges. Two of them were judges drawn from Maharashtra. 
my my dear friend General Jud and Mr. Justice Bhagwati, two of them were from this state. And ladies and gentlemen, I appeared before the Supreme Court and I told the judges when I got up to address them, I said, my lords, I am not appearing merely for the man who has briefed me in this case. He is only one person. But I am appearing for the thousands and thousands of people who are rotting in the jails of India without having been guilty of any fault except that they have supported democracy and freedom. I said even that may not impress your lordship. Now let me tell you something more. I said, I am appearing for all five of you. My God, the Chief Justice almost fell out of his table. <laughs> he said, Mr. Jack Swani, did you say this? I said, yes, my Lord, I have not only said it, but I am repeating it. And now the, what I am going to do for the next five minutes is addressing you only and not your brother judges. I said, have you heard of the country called Ghana? Ghana had a Chief Justice who helped the government of Ghana to draft the preventive detention law. And when that law came into force, <coughs> the Chief Justice was the first to be picked up under that law. For two years, nobody heard of what happened to the Chief Justice. And, my lords, after two years, a cryptic announcement appeared in the press <coughs> that the Chief Justice died of natural causes. That's the fate which awaits all five of you and I have come to rescue you from that fate and please hear it properly. Of course, after that they have heard me fully and, and ladies and gentlemen, I wound up my address telling them that my Lord's Indian democracy is not completely dead but it is in the coffin. The government wants to shut the lid of that coffin. Even they are ashamed of doing that dirty job themselves. They want you to do that dirty job for them. Question before you is not who is right or who is wrong. We are, we are right because we are on the side of democracy and freedom. The question is, are you willing to oblige the government by doing that dirty job for them? So ladies and gentlemen, I regret to say that both General Children and Sangwati break down Indian democracy. And there was only one judge who stood up with the Justice Khanna for whom the whole nation has to be grateful because the New York Times wrote an editorial that a grateful Indian nation should build a monument to the memory of that great judge because he stood up against the foe. And so, ladies and gentlemen, criminal justice system is spoiled by bad character of judges, bad choice of judges, <coughs> Didn't the Chief Justice Baruta make a statement while he was the Chief Justice of India that 20% of judges in the higher judiciary are corrupt? What has the bar done? I want to know. What has the what has the profession done? What has the university done? What have the politicians done? I wish to make it clear to you, ladies and gentlemen, that no government wants honest judges. Whichever government comes into power, they want corrupt judges because they are all the time trying to do corrupt things. Today, the lawyer might be worse than a rat, but the politicians are worse than the lawyers. The most hated, the most hated part of the Indian community is the politician of India today. Let me tell you something about the politicians. <laughs> The latest joke about politicians is that if one politician were to fall into a river and drown, it is a case of pollution. <laughs> but if all the politicians of the country fall into the river and drown, that is the solution. <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, that is the problem. The problem is that politicians want bad judges to be sitting on the bench and unfortunately there are judges who are willing to oblige the government at all times. 
I don't wish to cite illustrations because uh, I commit contempt, but I commit it in a subtle way. And uh, and my physiognomy and my temper are by themselves a contempt of court. And they is a contempt. Now can you see one? In the preventive detention laws, there used to be a provision that after the detention order is served and the <coughs> grounds are served and an accused, if he makes any representation, the matter must go to the advisory board. So what happened before the advisory board? There was no provision that a lawyer can defend an accused person before the advisory board. I had a strong argument before the Supreme Court and I partially won that right by interpretation. I said, I said, please tell me, if a person is dumb, how does he defend himself before the advisory board? He must have a mouthpiece and the only mouthpiece can be the lawyer. Ladies and gentlemen, by judicial decision, I got the right of the accused in the criminal justice system to have a lawyer present in the advisory board. Compulsory if the other side, if the department is represented by a lawyer, the, the detainee must have a lawyer by, as of right. But in other cases where the advisory board is satisfied that a person can't defend himself at all without the presence of a lawyer, he is entitled to have a lawyer, otherwise the order will be struck down. That is the essential requirement of law today under judicial made decisions and that underscores, ladies and gentlemen, the, the question of... Now, let me come to broader, broader considerations. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the highest human right, apart from those enumerated human rights of a lesser character, the highest human right of every citizen of India is to have a fair distribution of wealth and as a condition of existence which can be called at least decent and honorable. Does that exist? Go to the slums. Go to the poor man's cottages. Three million children every night go to bed without a morsel of food in their stomach. They are only living upon the lining of their own stomachs. See, see the nutrition of our children. Ill-nourished children not provided sufficient sustenance. All of them born underweight. And if they are born underweight, be sure that some of them are also born under intelligence. You are depriving them of the enjoyment of life. That is the greatest right in a democracy, ladies and gentlemen. And this right is taken away by who? It is taken away by corrupt politicians. Fifteen hundred billion dollars of money are stolen from this poor nation. Fifteen hundred billion dollars convert it into Indian rupees and your head will start rolling. If that amount were brought back to India, every Indian family will have at least three lakhs. Poverty will stand removed overnight. For thirty years you don't need a tax at all. If you have a tax free budget. India's national bank should stand right out. Ladies and gentlemen, I regret to say that the people of this country and the politicians of this country are not worried about this major crime against the poor people of India. It's the crime against the nation. I went to the Supreme Court of India, gave up my practice as a lawyer, I went there as a petitioner before the Supreme Court. Two honest judges of the Supreme Court heard that petition. How many of you know about it? Ladies and gentlemen, 
The hearing went on from 2009 to 2011. In 2011, July, the judgment of the Supreme Court was delivered. Credit to the Supreme Court of India, those two judges, they held three things. That we have not found a satisfactory explanation at all why there has been no effort at all to get back this money. There should have been a revolution in this country. People should have been at the streets, particularly the intelligentsia. Those who are very vociferous in their speech making, those who are eloquent in their expression, ladies and gentlemen, there is a famous Urdu proverb, Sitam ke daur mein wo ehle dil hi kaam hai. Zabaan pe naas tha jin ko wo bhe zabaan nikle. Those who are proud of their eloquence have turned out to be tongue-tied that you should speak like every minister. They are refusing to bring back the money and they are all the time taking, telling you about the gulag. Now, we are now trying to create new states for the purpose of restoring India's economy. The economy has gone down to those levels at which it stood in the demolished Europe and America in the year 2008. 10%, 12% growth has dwindled to 5% growth. The only province, only state of India which is an exception is Narendra Modi's. Narendra Modi's state is showing 12%. Yet he has to be demolished. Why? Because they say he is communal. Those who say that he is communal are communal themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, that takes me to one great right and that one great right which I wish to talk about. We are proud of the fact that we have created a secular society, a secular constitution of India. Where do you find the word secular in the constitution? Well, secular in the preamble for the purpose of telling people that secularism is the product of the emergency, which was another fraud. Nobody protested against it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want all young people to learn what secularism means under the Indian constitution. And that's the last thing which I wish to talk about today because that's one of the objects of India, of objects which I have to serve. Wherever I go, I tell them that no politician in this country knows even the ace of the word secularism. Secular India is created by Article 25 of the Constitution. Read Article 25. And those professors who are teaching the Constitution in this country must concentrate on this great article. Ladies and gentlemen, the part of Article 25 which is important is that every person has the right to profess and practice his religion. Good. Nobody, nobody has any objection. This was the article as it existed in the draft constitution of India when it came for discussion in the constituent assembly of India. It is the minorities, the Muslims and the Christians who said that we want one more right. What? What more do we want? We said we want not only the right to profess and practice, we also want the right to propagate our religion. Nehru and Ambedkar accepted this challenge. Sadar Patel accepted this challenge. He warned them that you are asking for something which is terrible. Don't ask for it. It will create lot of problems. They said, no, we want it. So the word propagate was added. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have the right to propagate your religion, what does it mean? It means that religion will hereafter compete in the free idea, the free market of ideas and debate. If you are entitled to propagate your religion, you are entitled to say that my religion is superior to yours. Otherwise, what is the meaning of propagating religion? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
now we have the right to propagate religion. But this requires an atmosphere which used to prevail only in the court of Emperor Akbar, which has never prevailed any time in Indian history. Emperor Akbar used to collect the leaders of all faiths. They used to sit and discuss every, every, every practice, every belief of every religion, whether it was Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, of all kinds. Nobody plunged a knife into somebody's neck. It was done in harsh language, but never in harsh action. Ladies and gentlemen, the right to propagate is a right the implications of which must now be understood. All these three rights are subject to the opening words of Article 25. The opening words of Article 25 are subject to public order, public health and public morality, these rights will prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, the corollary of this theorem is that the Republic has its own religion. The Republic as a religion, the elements of which are public order, morality and health. All denominational religions are subject to this superior religion of the Republic. Now when a conflict arises, when a conflict arises, say I am taking the Take, take an example of the Hindu faith. Supposing you want to say that a particular doctrine of the Holy Gita is contrary to public morals. You can't cite Gita to support it. There must be some other criterion of judgment by which you can pronounce upon this conflict of interest and conflict of, uh, of theory. Who will resolve it? Ladies and gentlemen, the only answer which the politicians are not prepared to give is that this conflict will have to be resolved by this small mammalian equipment called the human brain. It is the brain which will decide by argument of logic and reason. Thus, the essence of Indian secularism is that every citizen shall lead a life which is guided by reason and logic, but is inspired by this great dynamo of love and affection. Love and affection to preserve the peace in which discussion can take place. The ancient Bible said, go forth and multiply. Because the world's goods were plenty, the shares were few. To go forth and multiply, go on producing babies, it brought some more votaries of the religion. But that did not conflict with the national interest at that time, because this did not produce poverty and destitution. Today to say go forth and multiply is to tell people that the nation must commit suicide. The nation is committing suicide today because even that idiot called Sanjay Gandhi during the emergency thought of controlling numbers. No Congress politician has the courage today to talk about it. Why? What bad politics? Do you know the other day the Shai Imam of the Jumma Masjid made a public statement that I have asked my followers not to join Anna Hazare's fight against corruption. What? Either you like corruption or you have some better reason. <laughs> Obviously he likes corruption too. But ladies and gentlemen, what is the reason that he gave? The reason that he gave was that when these followers of mine go there, they sing one day Matram. Is there one person in this country with a sense of national respect that one day Matram is the song of which the India's freedom struggle has, has gone about? It has inspired thousands and thousands of martyrs in this country 
And here is the man who says that my followers will not sing the Vande Matram. As if it is some Vande Matram is some kind of a ayat from a religion. Ladies and gentlemen, I wrote an article that this Shai Imam must be deprived of his citizenship of India. There is not one politician in this country who has the courage to speak the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, if India has to be saved, you require politicians who are honest. And please, go and follow any political party except a party which does not bring about the stolen wealth of this country and which does not have the correct meaning of the word secularism. Restoring wealth and secularism are the two props of every justice system and it lies in the hands of intellectuals, those who pride themselves on their spoken word to speak up for a change. And thank you. That was indeed thought-provoking. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your words of wisdom and your experiences with us. We are truly, truly blessed to have you here. Thank you for showing us the real facet of legal system and changing our perspective. I'm sure all of us present here will leave with new beliefs and new objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that you all would agree with me that today the closing ceremony of the Human Rights Week has marked the opening of a new advocacy era in our college. And if I may, with all due respect, I will name it as the Jake Malani era. With these words, <laughs> with these words I would like to request Dr. Vikas Patnagar sir to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you, Bhushan Madam. It's a great opportunity for me that uh, I have been called here to deliver a vote of thanks. Sir, I would like to start with these lines. This is for you. Kuch shakshiyat hi aise hoti hai unki ki wo lo mein fir mein bhi alag nazar aate hai. Just like the police star in the night. I think this is one of the happiest day of our life that the full star of advocacy is shining in our institution. I, on behalf of the entire family of Marathwada Mithramandals Shankarao Chauhan Law College, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Honorable Mr. Ram J. Palani sir, Senior Advocate Supreme Court of India, for coming here and providing encouragement to our students. Sir, the thoughts and experiences you have shared with us today will serve a light in our path of achieving success. Sir, I am sure not only our students but everyone present here had been benefited with your words of wisdom. Thank you, sir. I would like to express a heartfelt gratitude towards Dr. Suresh Chandra Bhosle, sir, renowned Advocate and Chairman, Board of Studies, University of Pune, and Dr. Rashid Sheikh, sir, Dean Faculty of Law, University of Pune, for explaining their valuable time and sharing with us their opinion and thoughts. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude towards the Principal B. G. Jado, sir, Secretary Marathara Mithimandal, and other members of management for their guidance and support and encouragement to organize this event. Further, I would like to thank all the eminent guests, advocates and principals of the various institutions of Maratha Amit Mandal and other law colleges for gracing us. I am thankful to our media friends who are over here on our request to catch in power this wonderful moment. Finally, I would, like, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all my faculty members, ministry and staff of the college and the student volunteers for their hard work and support throughout the evening. Without uh, their efforts, an event like this cannot happen overnight. And at last, but not least, thank you to all our 
the students present over here listening to such eminent person will act as guiding force in our life ahead. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request our students of 4th pre of 5th BSL LLB, Ms. Mansi Kurukar, Ms. Ashwini Desh Pandey, and Ms. Sanjeevni Khatu to come for Pasai Dan. I would like to request all to please stand for it. Passar 